This video is sponsored by Ridge. More on them later. I really don't envy those people tasked with making video game sequels. It's hard enough to make a game with low expectations, but when you're developing a follow-up to something that will form a direct comparison to whatever you can come up with, then you better hope that you don't screw it up somewhere along the way. It's a bona fide miracle that any sequels are any good, let alone in a way that justifies its very existence by being an improvement on the first game, and with the recent glut of underwhelming sequels, I'm feeling an urge to highlight the more positive side of things. The best sequels aren't just great games, they improve on the original in a way that expands the scope of the game's world and marks itself as the quintessential title within its own franchise. You know, really easy stuff. Effectively, the best sequels out there make the original game fairly redundant and pointless, which is quite a hard thing to do, but if I can find enough games that do that, it's going to be pretty valuable for this video. It kind of reminds me of how the, the sequel to the old leather wallet that fits in your back pocket and is really massive has dropped recently, and Ridge are out here making like these amazing, stylish front pocket wallets that are so strong, they laugh in the face of chainsaws! Like, have you seen a horror film before? No one laughs at chainsaws! Don't tell me that you're still keeping your big chunky wallet in your back pocket like some kind of cave person. I myself have long since leapt into the future thanks to today's sponsors Ridge, with their incredibly sturdy wallets that are available in more than 30 colours and can hold up to 12 cards that you can now carry around in your front pocket with a bit of style. When I say that these wallets are sturdy, I mean that they're resistant to chainsaw attacks, and I'm sorry, but your leather equivalent is being turned to pulp in the same situation. Plus, Ridge were also kind enough to send me their waterproof commuter backpack with shock-resistant laptop holder and an external USB port for on-the-go charging, and now it's slightly safer to go outside, I'm gonna be using this quite a lot. Ridge comes with a lifetime warranty, so you can buy one wallet for the rest of your life if you so wish, with a 45 day return window for a free refund if you're not such a fan. Also, Father's Day is coming up and the Ridge wallet makes a great gift. Make sure you check out the Father's Day guide on the site and find the best gear for your dad. You can get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com forward slash rabidluigi and using the code rabidluigi. That link is also in the video's description if you don't fancy typing all of that out. It's time to move your wallet into the future. Alright, I guess we need to talk about some sequels now. And how best they are. So there's actually like a million different metrics by which you can judge a sequel, and I don't 100% know which ones I'm gonna pick, but for now, I'm kinda looking for sequels that expand the scope of a franchise and introduce a lot of different components that go on to be mainstays within that franchise. So, you know, if I could find some of those, that'd be really nice. There have been a lot of franchises over the past decade or so that have started reasonably well, but have exploded in success and quality with their second game. That makes my job difficult, because I want to talk about only one of them, but when I've got Mass Effect, Assassin's Creed, and Borderlands, just to name a few, it's some fierce competition with no clear winner. Except there is one, because when I'm playing through Uncharted 1, I notice that it's an enjoyable cover shooter that gets bogged down with repetitive sequences and some undercooked level design, but there's enough there for a sequel to come in and blow the pants off of everyone. There's this weird nervousness to Uncharted 1, as if it feels content to retread the same adventure beats as Tomb Raider and Indiana Jones, but reluctant to branch out and do something interesting. Hey, don't worry about it, Nathan Drake wakes up in the wreck of a crashed train in all sorts of trouble. This game gonna be fun. I first played the Uncharted games as part of the Nathan Drake collection on the PS4, which just meant that I could play the first and second games back to back and make some very easy comparisons between the two. I love playing confident games that know exactly what they want to do, and Uncharted 2 is so committed to giving you and Nathan Drake an adventure to remember that spans numerous countries and settings with the knowledge that this is all in service of some incredible levels of escapism, putting you in the driving seat of a larger than life quippy action hero who hangs off trains and murders hundreds without pausing to have a mental breakdown. The irony is that Uncharted 2 is Naughty Dog playing it relatively safe with this series since none of this is anything too new but it's so well refined that it feels like a sequel where they've combed through the original for any protruding edges and sanded them out of existence. 
Besides, if you're just here for a good time and not necessarily an improved time, Uncharted 2 also has one of the best multiplayers on the PS3, so now there's some replay value to keep you coming back. Mind you, the servers were shut down two years ago and the PS4 version didn't bring over the online play, so I guess we're just left with the excellent single player these days. Oh no, however will I cope? When a franchise doesn't use conventional numbering, everything is a sequel. But things get a tad complicated with Nintendo IP since most of them carry their games forward in a continuous stream without clear sequels. Would you honestly describe Super Mario Galaxy as a sequel to Super Mario Sunshine when the games are distinctly different in gameplay, design, tone and aesthetic feel? Nah, that'd be stupid, and so I'm left to look for more organic sequels in Nintendo's library and, rather inevitably, I land at Pokemon which yes, has a lengthy chronology of games that follow one after another with theoretically improvements being made every time, but not many of these are directly related. Black and White 2 would be easy candidates, but in reality I don't think they're massive improvements over the originals, or at least not by enough to warrant talking about them. Pokemon Gold and Silver though, as sequels to Gen 1, are slightly more justified, since Game Freak clearly wanted a second go at creating a Pokemon game, and given how many glitches there were in Red and Blue, can you blame them? I know that criticising Pokemon is the fun, trendy thing to do at the moment, because of course, the biggest critics of Pokemon are the fans themselves, but Gen 1 deserves a lot of credit for introducing Pokemon to the world, and for the most part, getting it pretty much bang on. All you need to do is evaluate it sometime after the fact and see where improvements can be made. It's like a director's cut. With both generations being on the same console and with Pokemon fans not knowing anything other than their franchise being represented by 8 bits, the connections between Gen 1 and Gen 2 are closer than perhaps any other two generations. All that does is make it easier to make more direct comparisons between the two, and while I don't think Gen 2 is a perfect set of games or have aged flawlessly, they do represent a significantly more optimised Pokemon experience than their predecessors. It's just a lot of little things really, and proof that Gen 1 wasn't quite the lightning in a bottle miracle that its explosion in mainstream media made it out to be, and while this massive popularity meant that a sequel was inevitable, the ways in which Game Freak improved on Gen 1 are really impressive. Most of the glitches have been ironed out, key tweaks to the game's balancing came at just the right time, and the decision to somehow squeeze a victory lap version of Kanto in there can only be described as inspired. I'll accept that I put this generation on a pedestal sometimes because I grew up with it and I have very fond memories of playing and replaying the game into the ground, but from a slightly more objective point of view, the improvements it made on Gen 1 are frankly a little tricky to quantify sometimes because they're so widespread. Pokemon may have moved on to bigger and better things in the years since Pokemon Gold, Silver and Crystal, but I'd still say that the Heart Gold and Soul Silver remakes are some of the best, if not the best Pokemon games out there, games that simply updated these incredible sequels to more modern times. I don't think we would have gotten the franchise we have now if Gen 2 didn't fix so much. Missing though would have been the face of Pokemon. I will be surprised if Overwatch 2 turns out to be a pretty spectacular sequel. And while I can see what Blizzard are trying to do by focusing on PvE and trying to revitalize their player numbers, uh, I think there's a long way for them to go, and I don't think the change will be radical enough for players to flock back in the millions that they want. You know, I guess in the meantime they can always force it down our throats as an eSport instead. And that should be a concern for Blizzard, because Overwatch 2 really does need to be dramatically different in order to convince people to invest a large amount of their time into this multiplayer experience in a way that they didn't quite manage with the first game. Since comparing Overwatch to Team Fortress 2 is a thing that people used to do all the time, maybe it's worth pointing out how incredible TF2 is as a standalone game and as a sequel to a completely different type of game? Or would that just make everyone unnecessarily mad? That's <laughs> the internet, you're all unnecessarily mad. Don't worry though, I'm not going to be doing it for much longer because it is interesting to compare Overwatch with TF2 and how much the qualities of each game at a particular time has put one game on top of the other. When Overwatch first came out, all the comparisons threw shade on TF2, but now that Overwatch is winding down, suddenly TF2 is looking pretty spectacular again. Joke's on you though, TF2 has always been spectacular. 
Maybe not always, though, because current day Team Fortress 2 is definitely a little less exciting and well supported than it was in its heyday, but the legacy this game has as a crucial cornerstone of free to play multiplayer shooters is 100% undisputed. Class based first person shooters are a dime a dozen these days, but 2007 was a different time when there really weren't many, if any, games out there with this level of personality and an eye for detail that would take the rest of the industry roughly a decade to catch up to. On its own, Team Fortress 2 is an outstanding achievement for Valve that has spent virtually its entire existence among the top played games on Steam, but when compared to the original Team Fortress, the difference is night and day. Valve went silent on this game for six years after initially showing TF2 at E3 1999 as a more realistic top-down RTS, and I don't know what happened in the early 2000s that changed Valve's mind on how to approach this sequel, but holy shit, what a decision that was. Putting so much focus on giving the playable roster of characters uniquely hilarious personalities helps to give TF2 a timeless quality that is completely absent from Team Fortress Classic, and has helped it to dominate any comparisons between the two. Why play Brown Shooter number 289 when you can throw piss at large Russian man with an even larger gun? Can your Overwatch do that? The sign of a great sequel is being surprised to hear that a game came before it, even if there's a number at the end of its name. That sounds really counterintuitive because of course a sequel has an original game, but when the sequel is transformative to the point of consuming every trace of that first game, it's an easy mistake to make. The first Street Fighter game is a very basic fighting game that you should all play at some point just so you can see for yourselves how far this franchise has come since 1987, and especially the absolute chasm between itself and its sequel made four years later. Capcom realised that the six-button version of Street Fighter 1 was significantly more popular among arcade players than the original cabinet, with fewer buttons, and so built Street Fighter 2 from the ground up to incorporate this control scheme. Evidently, it worked pretty well, because I don't think many people remember that the original Street Fighter exists in favour of the spectacular franchise that spawned from its sequel. You know, minus the usual Capcom fuckery. I think Street Fighter 2 has helped a lot from just how many different versions of the game were released on a ton of different consoles that helped keep the game in the public consciousness for a lot longer. It's not quite a Todd Howard with Skyrim situation where he keeps forcing one of his least glitchy games down our throats at every possible convenience, but it's perhaps a sign of Capcom knowing what kind of incredible game they had on their hands. One that should be on every console and should have a few extra versions just in case someone didn't get a chance to play Street Fighter 2 yet. The longevity of this game is one of its most remarkable characteristics because Street Fighter 2 is played and appreciated as the influential fighting game that it is and is still being played competitively at the highest level. And hey, I know the first game isn't a complete train wreck or anything, but could you honestly say any of that applies to this as well? Anything good about this franchise was spawned from the sequel and can be traced back to Capcom getting everything so right at the start of a decade when they got quite a lot of things right. Certainly went better than Captain Commando. Building on what I was talking about with Street Fighter 2, you can tell a great sequel from a mile away based on how few people talk about the first game, or at least when compared to the second. I know sequels are always meant to be bigger and better because that's how marketing works, but sometimes developers outdo themselves and create something like Silent Hill 2. Now, I like Silent Hill 1 a lot, and I think it does a lot with limited hardware and graphical restrictions, but all that meant is that Konami were perfectly positioned to make the sequel exactly how they wanted with a beefier console at their disposal. Not that Silent Hill 2 is too reliant on the PS2 to say what it has to say, but I can't say with any certainty that it'd be able to generate the kind of oppressive atmosphere that supports so much of its best moments without a little technical help. Now we can use the fog as symbolism instead of a workaround of hardware limitations. That's pretty handy. Silent Hill 2, to me, is pretty much my go-to when I think of horror games at their most effective. Dripping in creepy ambience to keep the player in a heightened state of suspense coupled with deliberately awkward controls so that you can never feel comfortable and in control of any situation, and while you can definitely attribute a few of these characteristics to the original as well, Silent Hill 2 works as much more of a complete perfect storm of the best tropes that horror has since morphed and run into the ground in the succeeding decades. The legacy of Silent Hill's sequel is one of heavy symbolism and powerful horror, but also the introduction of Pyramid Head as one of the most terrifying monsters in all of gaming, and rightfully one of the most iconic too. 
It's far from flawless, and there's definitely a section of players who won't appreciate how awkward some of the game design is at times, but as a landmark of horror and a sequel to the first Silent Hill, this is as good as it gets. What I wouldn't give for a well-handled reboot. This is Rabbit Luigi, and it's been so long since we had an amazing Silent Hill game that I often wonder if we over-exaggerate the praise for Silent Hill 2 a bit, out of desperation that someone will come along and make a game exactly like it in the future. The encouraging thing is that critics 20 years ago kind of loved Silent Hill 2, so it's just something that's carried on over time. In the end, this is a franchise that peaked too soon, and everything that followed Silent Hill 2 ranged from being kind of good to very, very average and mediocre. The real horror was the franchise we lost along the way. Hi, just want to give a quick shout out to some of my top supporters on Patreon. We have Ramon Alberto, Jerome Kiryu, Fusion Warrior, Sarah Malion, Christopher Robinson, Joe Creamer, Scott Riker, Frank Giong, I think, I'm, I'm so sorry, The Green Scorpion, and Devon Hutt. Thank you all for supporting what I do on YouTube, and if you want to join them, you can go to patreon.com forward slash rabbitluigi, where I post updates and behind the scenes stuff, and we generally have a really good time. Also, what topic would you like to see me cover next? Leave your suggestion in a comment on this video, because I'll be taking the best ideas and making a poll on my community tab, which you can then vote on to decide what the next video is about. I'll be announcing the winner of the poll over on my Twitter, so make sure you follow me so you don't miss out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.